we'll start today, I think, with just a word about context. How is it that we are all here in this room at Southern Oregon University on a sunny Saturday morning? No question, it has been a dispiriting summer here in Southern Oregon. A month's worth of severe smoke conditions resulted in a loss to our economy. We worried about our personal and community health status. We walked down sidewalks trying to identify each other behind the mask we wore to try to deflect smoke from our lungs. It was depressing and it was scary. We began to wonder about the future of our community. Perhaps you saw the cover page of the Mail Tribune this August 15th. The top headline, Wildfire Fight is Far From Over, described conditions on the ground created when we have a forest that is terribly vulnerable to fire. The article in the right column, Scientists Predict Warmer Five Years, warned us that the weather patterns that feed fire will probably be even worse in the future. Described in the article, the statement was that we ex can expect anomalously warm conditions even beyond what climate forecasts have predicted. Now, nothing about this situation is easy, although today we should be very glad that we don't have hurricanes in our community. Um, still, we are a tough bunch, and this morning we come together as a community to try to understand the multiple issues involved in smoke and fire, and to begin the process of identifying pragmatic steps forward that can keep our community safer and help us figure out how to become more resilient even in the face of difficult conditions. This morning is the beginning of many discussions to come in the months ahead. So finally, I'd just add, like to add a few thanks and a word about this morning's logistics. As you can see, we have a lot of information to share in a short time. We are nothing if not optimists here today. We have four panels, and we are going to move as quickly as we can from one to the next. We have not scheduled a formal break in the morning. So please feel free to get up and move around whenever you need to between each panel. We'll have a couple of minutes of transition where you can stand up and stretch and maybe run to the bathroom. Um, but do feel free to move around whenever you need to. Uh, and because we have so much to share, we are not going to take audience questions during the presentations. Instead, we will invite you to stay after the, the formal presentations are over at the end of the morning to engage with each other in the informal discussion. And finally, a few thanks. And in addition to our phenomenal panel members, who you will see up here this morning, I want to acknowledge Deanne Everson, Joe Feil, Bella Manray, Marco Bay, Hannah Soule, and Kate Jackson for help today and for consultation as we put the event together. Thank you to SOU for place and logistics and to RBTV for ensuring that we'll be able to share today with others who cannot be here this morning. A special call out to Paige Pruitt, who handled the logistics of this gathering, um, put together in a very short period of time, so there were lots of logistics, and to Green Springs Inn and Cabins, who provided accommodations for several of our panelists. So thank you. Um, lots of, lots of and we are going to kick off this morning's discussion around the question of our forests. Um, we understand that we have forests that for a variety of reasons are particularly vulnerable. Um, we need to understand why that's happened and what we may be able to do about it. And now I would like to introduce um, Don Ferguson. Don is a retired BLM Natural Resources Staff Administrator. He worked for the U.S. Forest Service in Washington and Oregon from 1969 until joining the Medford District Bureau of Land Management in 1981. He is retired from the BLM in 2006 but remains active in managing large fires throughout the U.S. In fact, he just came off a fire about three days ago, four days ago, um, where he worked all summer. His current focus is managing the public information needs generated by large fires, hurricanes, and other large-scale emergencies. And Don will serve as our moderator for the Forest Management Panel today. Good morning. Uh, I've known Marco quite a while, and I just met the other two panelists, and I'd really quickly introduce you to them so we can hear from them. Dr. Christopher Dunn is a research associate in the College of Forestry at Oregon State University. He spent eight years in fire suppression and fuels management prior to 
pursuing research on contemporary fire effects and ecosystem response to mixed severity fires. His current research focuses on the safety and effectiveness of large fire management. He leverages his operational experience and research training to bridge the gap between science and management and to better prepare land and fire managers for the changing fire environment. Does that sound like you? Very ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, next to him, Mark Webb is the executive director for Blue Mountains Forest Partners, a diverse group of stakeholders who utilize best available science and work collaboratively to increase the pace and scale of restoration on the Malheur National Forest. Prior to this, he served as Grant County Judge, taught at Eastern Oregon University, and worked in natural resource related jobs across Eastern Oregon. Mark believes that strong, vibrant communities and healthy landscapes are inseparably linked. I really look forward to hearing from him. And Marco Bay is the co founder and executive director of Loma Katsi restoration project, which develops and implements forest and watershed restoration programs and initiatives throughout Oregon and Northern California, working with federal and state agencies, tribal governments, industry, and other nonprofit organizations. And Marco also serves as the board president of the Northwest Forest Worker Center and board member of Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative. So we will hear from them, uh, starting with Chris, please. Thanks, Tom. So just so everybody knows, I have a bad cough, so maybe it's appropriate for this type of summit on the snow. Um, so if I go into a fit, just bear with me, I'll get over it. If I pass out, bear with me, I'll get back up. Um, I was asked to come and talk about sort of the history and how we got to today's, I guess, fire environment is how I would put it. Um, so I'm going to go through some, some history and, and then uh, end with where I think we stand today. We're really stuck between two paradigms. Before the colonization of the West by the Euro-Americans, the Native Americans had their relationship, right? So they had a relationship with fire, with force, that was fundamentally different than what we have today, and it's essentially what we've imposed on the landscape. And it really is important to understand that this is a linkage between society and the force. We drive that drive the conditions of the forest, and a lot of that is through fire, through our interactions with fire, whether it's through fire use or the suppression of fire. Um, so we're stuck between these two paradigms, one of suppression and one of sort of living with fire and uh, utilizing it to its great advantage for farming, hunting, and that sort of thing, which is what the Native Americans' perspective were. So how did this change happen? Well, somewhere in 1891, we have the Forest Reserves Act, right? And this really started to establish where we were taking some of the land out, it's really out of the public domain into um, forest reserves at the time, which is now the Forest Service, so National Forest Lands and ultimately the Forest Service. It was the general land office at the time. Um, and the Forest Service established in 1905, and they were really afraid of a timber famine and, and, and worried about that coming out of the Midwest, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot. Uh, displayed here in this image, of course. And there was debate about the merits of that. Should we have lands in, in public ownership? Should they remain in private? And so the Forest Service largely remained underfunded. That is until the big burn of 1910 or the great fires of 1910. Right? So we saw fires all across the West, not just uh, Idaho and Montana, although they get, uh, the, they get the main storyline. When you think of Idaho and Montana as as the main impetus, and you can see that because of that large blob of fire that uh, precipitated up there in the, in the panhandle of Idaho. Three million acres burned up there, 88 firefighters died. Right, so this was what Gifford Pinchot saw an opportunity to lobby Congress and, and the federal government for additional funding to give purpose to the Forest Service at this time. Um, it was a local disaster, there was lots of death and, and lots of private properties, homes, whole towns, whole towns evacuated. Uh, Timothy Egan wrote a, a great book about this, and so did Stephen Pine, and maybe many of you have read that. But at a local, despite being a local disaster, um, Gifford Pinchot leveraged it as a national success at the time. And that really precipitated the, the 1911 Weeks Act, Weeks Act me, that fostered the state fire programs with federal funds. So we really started ramping up Fire suppression is how we were going to proceed 
into the future. And it really was a direct political response to those large fires, those 1910 fires. Now, it wasn't without debate either. In 1910, in our you know, esteemed Sunset Magazine of the Pacific Northwest, uh, that this debate really played out in the literature. And it was really focused in Sunset Magazine into the 20s. Um, but back even at 1910, when those suppression policies were being pursued, um, many of the practitioners out in the West were saying, wait a minute, I think we want to continue this light burning policy that, or program policy interaction that the Native Americans had here in an effort to protect the actual timber base, the wet forest lands here in the, you know, obviously in the Northwest. Um, and that debate raged on into the 20s. Now we're already entering into this fire suppression paradigm, but people are still pushing, and in particular the timber industry was pushing for more light burning in the dry forest, the pine forest as they called it, as an effort to protect both their homes and to protect the timber resources in the wet forest that burn less frequently. Um, and so at that time it was really uh, the timber industry's proponent of more fire. Uh, so the debate raged on, they decided they are going to take a look at it at some summits, um, Forest Service chiefs were still um, out there actively lobbying for fire suppression. It really bolstered and built the Forest Service. And so here William Greeley is, is writing in the Timberman about the fallacy of light burning or pine forestry as he called it at the time. Um, and you can see we're still having very similar debates, although maybe the positions of people are, have, have switched. Uh, well, fire exclusion one, despite forest industry wanting it, <laughs> Um, Forest Service fights against it, and they had a light burning committee, and ultimately suppression, um, so the suppression paradigm really dominated after that. Uh, within so 23 years, so this is published in 1943 in the Journal of Forestry, um, and there's an image on the bottom uh, showing the same stand from 1909 and 1948. Within you know, 20 to 40 years, we already started to see the consequences of this transition from one fire sort of paradigm to the new. Right, so now we've been in this state that we see that occurred in the 1940s all the way through to today. And we're still largely in that effort. And of course we've modified the forest in other ways through timber management and that's all. And so today we have this increasingly complex wildfire environment. So we've altered the forest structure, increased fuel loadings. That happened because we were suppressing fires, allowed the forest to densify. We've also, of course, had a, a large timber management program, especially here in Oregon, Washington, or the West, and uh, that modified the forest structure as well. Um, and then with that, we've seen this massive expansion of the wildland urban interface. You know, Ashland being one of those, but many communities around the West reside in that, that sort of situation. And we continue to expand and grow out into that. And that puts us at the forefront of this altered forest environment. And of course, that continues to influence how the forest is managed or fire is managed as well. There's a significant influence there. And then with that came climate change. So while we were going through this suppression paradigm, from about 1948, 49 to mid-80s, 84, 85, there was really a cool and wet summer periods here in the Northwest. So you can see it in the climate records, um, not just looking back through you know, deep climate history, but recent climate history where we have actual data, you can see that fundamentally our summers were wetter and they were cooler than they are even in the 80s and of course certainly then today with climate change exacerbating that. And so we sort of built our expectations off of that climate paradigm. What we could do, how we can manage our forest, how we can interact with our forest was built off of this cooler, wetter climate period and we have certainly come out of that and climate change projects that too to be much worse and, and certainly exacerbate the conditions that we see today. And now we're stuck in this sort of wildfire paradox, right? So suppression got us, or at least contributed in part to the conditions we see on the landscape, but because the conditions are so severe and the destruction that comes with communities um, and some of our ecosystems, uh, there's this real impetus to continue suppression, right? So we're in this paradox. The problem is now the solution, which is also the problem sort of stuck cycling in this. But new paradigms are emerging. There's a lot of discussions, including this one, that are coming. <laughs> it must have been a hot day for me. So we're really after, you know, there's this discussion about extending 
what I say, more of the right kind of fire, the right place, the right time for the right reasons, right? And we really want to foster resilience in both of our communities and our ecosystems to fire and to climate change, right? So these are sort of symbiotic, we need to move forward together. And the cohesive, the national cohesive strategy really um, harnessed this and grabbed this and, and believes in this. And it's really an all lands, all hands approach. So we're not, it's not just federal agencies, it's state agencies, it's communities, it's everybody trying to come together and really resolve this issue. And ultimately with this vision of learning to live with wildland fire in some fashion. It's inevitable, we're not going to exclude it permanently. Um, we can moderate some of its effects, including its effects on smoke. Um, and what they really are saying is that we need resilient communities or fire adapted communities. We need a safe and effective wildfire response. And we need resilient ecosystems. And you can turn that into this, back to this perspective of the social ecological system. We see we're talking about communities, ecosystems, and response. And that's really these three interacting subsystems in this social ecological system that need to adapt and move forward to some new paradigm. And that is the social system, we need to adapt the ecological system, and we need to adapt our fire management system. And that's where I reside mostly today, is focused on that fire management system and what we can do to make those efforts uh, more efficient and more effective. Uh, but uh, you know, I, of course, part of the ecological system, the social system is a little bit outside of my realm of research and perspective, but it's really about adapting communities and, and their homes to be uh, resi resilient to wildfire. And we're at a stage that we're probably behind today because of the immensity of the problem that uh, it's going to take a lot, long, long time to unravel it. Um, we have to first get past the conflict that we're at right today and just the debate as to whether we need to do something at all or not. Um, but it really is just about our future. So thank you. Thanks, Chris, for letting me use your mic. And uh, Mark, can we hear from you, please? Yes. Um, so first, I hate to do this, but I apologize. I'm liable to break down, maybe tear up. Get closer to the mic. I'm liable to break down and tear up a little bit. This issue is really important to me. So from West Texas, we're not supposed to shed tears, show tears. But we might probably will. So I think notably, Chris ended on the word conflict, and that characterizes Grant County. <coughs> If I had slides, if I had a slideshow, there would be three slides. One would be trench warfare, where industry is shooting at the environmental community, and the enviros are shooting back. Unfortunately, they were a little bit smarter when it came to legislation, so we didn't get ahead. Next slide is a truce of sorts, and then the last slide is we're actually working together pretty well. And so, what I'm going to talk about is how we got there. It's process. And uh, my experience, my conviction is that this is a lot about social relationships, uh, informing civic disagreement, and maturing that conversation. So that's what we went through, and that's what I want to try to communicate with you. So first, some history. Uh, Grant County, a large county geographically, small population-wise. There's probably almost as many people in here today as we have in the county. Uh, but we are resource-dependent. Uh, logging and ranching are our heritage, and we still depend on it. We don't have very many other options. It's pretty critical to us. Over 60% of Grant County is federally owned and managed. Um, and that, how they manage that is critically important for our socioeconomic opportunities. It, it limits them or it opens them up. And so again, it's really important for us what happens on public lands. Uh, by the late 80s, uh, we've been logging uh, Grant County since before the turn of the century. By the late 80s, it is a fire adapted landscape. Chris did an excellent job showing probably what it was like before. Um, as a result of management practices and, and interest, uh, for example, commercial, that's, commercial interest, uh, management practices, both entirely legitimate. It's appropriate to get commercial value out of timber. The management practices that were implemented made the best of sense at the time, uh, really pretty good. Um, but as a result of that, there were significant departures in the type of species that we saw in the landscape. The density of trees that were now on the landscape as well as the structure on the landscape and those are all important to what Chris was talking about in terms of uh, landscapes now that are much more prone to catastrophic fires which were uh, pretty unusual in the past at least for a lot of Oregon. 
And uh, again, I just something I want to stress from our perspective, fire suppression for a lot of folks makes a lot of sense. We want to save our house because it means a lot, it's commercially valuable, has value to it. Same for timber. So again, while fire suppression may not have been the smartest choice long term, it made a lot of sense at the time, and I want to come back to that in a bit. So by the late 90s, early 2000s, the Spotted Owl had really shut down um, pretty heavy timber activity on the west side. <coughs> Industry had shifted east side. Our timber harvest levels ticked up pretty significantly. A lot more logging going on. The environmental community also took more interest in that, particularly as we started to harvest some uh, big salvage sales. And by the early 2000s, they had effectively shut down active management on the Malheur National Forest, and active management there amounted to logging. So they had shut down our industries, and we were pretty desperate. Um, but interestingly enough, by the mid-2000s, 2003, 4, 5, um, the environmental community became alarmed that they were beginning to lose the old growth trees that they'd saved from the loggers to catastrophic wildfire, to unnatural wildfire. The loggers were pretty desperate to get any wood, and again, I just want to stress, I'm talking about process and people who couldn't stand one another coming together to have more mature conversations. And so these are not groups that you get in a room very easily, and some of those early conversations that we had, industry would be on this side, the environmental community would be in the back, and we had to have a neutral facilitator to sort of say, well, so-and-so said this, walk across the room, talk to them back and forth. <laughs> I mean, it was that kind of animosity, and you can really appreciate it because there are serious and significant vested interests across the board, all of them legitimate, really. Um, so we started that conversation, and I'll say that was a painful process. I personally stepped away from it three times, getting frustrated or infuriated those crazy environmentalists, and I mean, I'm not being fair to them, but that's how I felt at the time. And they could say the same thing about industry or community sort of oriented perspectives. Um, but we started that long, painful process, and it was about developing relationships to where we could have hard conversations with people we disagreed about or disagreed with. And um, it took humility. We had to admit, all the parties had to admit that we had gotten some things wrong. And you can realize that that opens up an element of vulnerability that's really important for having fruitful conversations. We had to increase our understanding of one another. <laughs> you know, loggers and environmentalists could go out and they could say, we really value the environment, but what that value meant didn't mean the same thing to the group. So we had to, to gain that understanding, see where people were coming from. And all of that uh, was a precondition for trust. We weren't going to take any risk with one another until we began to trust one another that you understood us, that you heard us. Didn't mean that you agreed with us, but you knew where we were coming from. And as we did that, we were able to start asking, well, how do we move forward? Instead of trying to blame people or management practice or things that happened in the past, how do we move forward from the situation we're in right now? And that's where we got to. We were willing to engage risk across the board. Um, that required a shared decision space. We all agreed that we were beginning to trust one another, we were willing to risk one another, risk um, things with one another, but we needed a shared decision space. And that's where best available science came in for us. Uh, we needed that to provide the sideboards. And again, this is something that Chris and others that he works with have provided for us. Science didn't necessarily answer the questions we had, but it provided that framework to where industry and environmentalists could ask, well, if this is what the landscape needs, how do I accommodate my interest and my values to meeting that landscape need? For industry, that might mean retooling how they go about timber harvest. For the environmental community, that might mean we're going to actually support more active harvest, something in principle we were opposed to in the past. So those are the ways in which that happened. And so with that shared decision space, with increased relational maturity, I'd say, um, and we were able to have the hard conversations. And I think the last thing I want to share about process is that uh, we began to ask, maybe not always consciously, what does the landscape need? And I don't say that. Um, so some industry might say that's a green question, you know, too environmentalist centric. But when you've taken from the landscape for over 100 years, 
you still depend on it. It makes a lot of sense. Well, what would a healthy landscape look like? Not how many board feet can I get off per acre because this is what I need to make a living. Or how much can I set aside because I don't like active management in certain places and I don't want to see any footprint from people. You ask, what does the landscape need after a hundred years of active management? When we could do that, and we can start to accommodate our interest to that, then we can have the conversations whereby we can start to provide the solutions and make a difference both for the landscape and the communities that depend on those landscapes. And so that's for us why I say for, it's very much a social process about developing relationships, mature relationships, to have hard conversations. We don't care so much about what happened in the past, we care about what's going on in the future. And those are preconditions for having a healthy conversation. So that's Blue Mountains Forest Partners. It was much more colorful in the actual process. Uh, I, um, yeah, I embarrassed myself a lot of times. But, uh, yeah. I think uh, that's been our experience. And I think uh, in terms of this wildfire issue, smoke, health, community, that's the approach that our experience suggests is needed to really resolve this and move forward in ways that are going to make a difference across the board in an integrated fashion. Good morning. Um, I will congratulate us. We're almost there. Uh, the fire season is not quite over, but we made it through a pretty rough summer. It was a challenging week. Uh, I'm going to share um, some examples of potential opportunities, build on um, years of work uh, and collaborative process, kind of build on what uh, Chris and Mark have talked about, uh, especially around collaboration and a community coming together to address uh, really complex issues. Um, the Road Forest Restoration Initiative. So I'll skip that one. Um, I'll start out um, with our partners over here at the table, Darren Borges and Terry Fairbench and George McKinley. If you have questions uh, after I complete my presentation uh, about the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative's Road Basin Cohesive Forest Restoration Strategy, we feel it's a vehicle and a tool to go forward and actually put some solutions on the ground to care for our forests and restore that resilience. So resilience and adaptation are really the two words that come to mind for our forests, for our ecosystems, and our communities. So within the Rogue Basin, um, we've identified about uh, 2.1 million acres that are overly dense in need of restorative treatments. And uh, we're gonna talk about about 1.1 million acres that we can invest in those efforts in very strategic, ecologically focused approaches to restore the landscape. You can see on this map with some of the work done by um, the Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy and some of the efforts. If you look at the road basin, we are in a dry forest system, fire adapted ecosystem, frequent fire system. Fire will continue to come. How do we learn to adapt and live with fire and manage fire and restore these lands so fire can come back in a healthy way? I think about the year I moved here in 1987 was the 87 fires. Um, this is a photograph from Happy Camp, California, where I spent a lot of seasons working for the Forest Service in the reforestation uh, era. Um, this is a quote from the, from the newspaper, Happy Camp newspaper, and um, it's actually written verbatim there. There's a typo in there, but it's not, not for me. But, um, you know, heavy smoke uh, inundated the community for, for weeks, and it was a real eye-opener uh, as to these fire-adapted systems, even though this is a natural part of the cycle of where we live. Uh, the community was plagued with this fire. Um, a lot of resources came to, to deal with this particular fire. 11,000 lightning strikes across the West during that year and uh, a very dynamic fire environment for those of our fire professionals that remember that. Uh, and then in the 2000, we had the fires in Colorado, a really intense year. Um, you know, 850 structures burned throughout the country. We're, we're upwards of 8,000 for this year. So uh, that could be uh, related to what Chris talked about with uh, the wildland urban interface and more expansion into that. But uh, the fire dynamic is changing, a lot of suppression costs. And uh, as a result of that, there was the National Fire Plan, a community-based effort through the um, Community Wildfire Assistance Program. Uh, that's a photo I took from Interstate 5 in 2004. Uh, that's of the ridge between uh, Wrights Creek and Bear Creek in partnership with the city of Ashland in their fire and fuels program to uh, abate the threat of fire on private lands. We inherited a pretty big uh, 100 years of suppression, and the federal government was coming to assist private landowners. 
So uh, all those bullets there uh, talk about those approaches, um, and those approaches haven't changed. This collaborative effort hasn't changed. It's, we've been evolving and learning more as we go. Um, that's to the footprint of the 1959 fire that is really dense, and the work continues there. Mm -hmm. A lot of the effort was focused around homes, around home site defensible space. This is up on Strawberry Lane here in Ashland, uh, one of our crew members, trying to reduce that uh, fuel density around homes to protect homes. But then we realized we need to move beyond homes, working with our, our fire professionals, our civic leaders. You can see that photo on the left. We have a uh, flathead of Bora Beetle, a lot of uh, mortality uh, mixed with uh, understory brush. So trying to um, restore or reduce the fuels in the ingress and egress. So the, the homes were protected, but fire response had to be able to get to those homes. So we were focused a lot on road systems and strategic areas. Then we had Stewardship Authority come about, uh, which is a great tool to work with federal agencies uh, to put restoration on the ground, thinking as we're treating the private lands, we need to be treating the federal lands, and we need to be working in all lands context, because fire knows no boundaries. So with the, the um, Agencies Appropriations Act of 1999, we were able to get some projects on the ground. These are photos from Williams, Oregon. Um, exactly what Mark talked about, bringing the timber community together with the conservation community and the forest worker uh, capacity to get some good work done on the ground. These are projects occurring right next to private lands where national fire plan dollars got put on the ground. Uh, this is on BLM lands, uh, where we're, we're actually utilizing some of the small diameter material and building that uh, framework and that model. So when we think about forest restoration, it's um, assisting the recovery of the ecosystem uh, that's been degraded in impact. In this case, it's fire exclusion, um, ecological resilience for that system to be able to adapt and respond to disturbances, and then adaptive capacity. The, the, the word climate change is, is buzzing around in all of our minds as these fires are increasing. So just to look uh, in a few places outside of the region, this is the rural forest-based community of Till, Oregon and South Umca. They had a huge fire in 2005, the Boulder Fire. We were able to bring the timber community together with the conservation community and begin to address the impacts to uh, uh, fire to plantations and late successional reserve habitats. You can see those small logs on, on the left there. Uh, that photo of the timber community working in tandem with uh, Umca Watersheds, a conservation organization in, in Loma Casa to diversify these plantations to try to utilize some of the material out of those plantations, reduce fire threat, but also restore structure for wildlife and habitat. This is the skips and gaps approach, um, trying to uh, diversify the stand structure. Now moving to the Ashland Forest Resiliency Stewardship Project, we have our, our partners Chris Chambers, uh, Division Chief of the City of Ashland, over there. if you have questions, this has become a national model of how to address impacts um, to the community through wildfire restore late successional habitat for and protect habitat for the Northern Spotted Owl and uh, protect the infrastructure and ecosystem services in the community. It was uh, designed in an integrated approach, thinking about the municipal watershed, the spotted owls, and uh, restoring open forest conditions um, and protecting the community. There's a lot of partners involved. It's an all-ends approach. We were selected uh, across the country for the Joint Chiefs Landscape Program. Here's a photo of that uh, quintessential wildland urban interface. And still very dense throughout this landscape. A lot of work to do to uh, treat those impacts. Um, this is the moat around the castle. We're looking at a 53,000 acre, 52,000 acre uh, footprint where, where we would treat 14,500 acres of that landscape in an ecological way. 28% of the landscape with the hopes of interrupting and abating the threat of fire. Protecting large old trees is a big emphasis of that effort. And then the boots on the ground, the people who put this effort on the ground, um, uh, from the marking to the layout of the projects, a very different uh, approach to a collaborative process through the partnership, where the partners do a lot of the work in tandem with the agency. And uh, the skill sets on the ground to identify those key things we really care about, like the big old trees. And then a very robust multi-party monitoring effort led by the Nature Conservancy to um, learn as we go, learn by doing, uh, a feedback loop on how our treatments can, can be conducted in the public manner. To date, we've treated um, about 9,000 acres across the federal and private. You may have seen helicopters, you might see smoke during the fall and the winter. A lot of jobs created through this effort, uh, 17 full-time equivalent, uh, 25 million infused into communities, 200 personnel employed, contractors employed, so it's a shift to a restoration economy 
And this collaborative process is happening all throughout Oregon. These are the collaboratives. Uh, there's many of them. Uh, Mark uh, expressed one in the, the Blue Mountains, but uh, many throughout the state trying to deal with these complex issues. Here's our wildfire season in Oregon and California. A lot of, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke um, <laughs> efforts uh, over the hill in the Klamath Basin uh, in the Sage Step country of uh, uh, Modoc County. So all these collaborative efforts happening to restore the system, to make these forests more resilient, dense forests uh, impacting our habitats we care about, like our oak woodlands, the loss of large old trees from densification, shading, and then trying to get fire back on the ground. A great example down in the mid Klamath with the Canoe Tribe and partners. So real quick, to, just to close up here, um, one solution forward and a, a big effort is the Little Basin a forest restoration piece, a strategy for our, our, um, our part of the world. How are we going to address these impacts to, to um, the communities from wildfire risk and the restoration needs? And this approach is very similar to what we've been talking about. There's going to be uh, no new roads proposed through this strategy. Primary objective is restoration. It's grounded in the Northern Spot Owl Recovery Plan. And we're going to limit impacts. It's a, it's a tool, and it, this is an operation forward. Um, utilizing an ecological fitting approach, reducing wildfire risk to people, uh, supporting fire adapted communities, and promoting uh, economic growth, that triple bottom line of the social, ecological, and economic. Some of the things that were analyzed in that, uh, in that plan, um, unfortunately I'm going to be running out of time here, so I'm going to keep moving, but there are folks who can talk about this. It's a lot of the same great stuff we've been talking about, but this is the plan for the Rogue, Rogue Forest Initiative. We're, we're moving forward to raise dollars, to work across the landscape in a collaborative fashion with our agency partners and communities, to address the threat of fire, to create more resilient systems, and create jobs within the process. Uh, it's, a, it's a big um, big lift, but we're up for the challenge, and we look forward to community input on these efforts. Thank you, job at keeping us on time here. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry you had to rush so much. We still have uh, 20 minutes for discussion. So my job right now is to try to channel, if we were taking questions from you, what do I imagine those questions might be? <laughs> uh, and when I look out here, I see, uh, I recognize a lot of people. It's really thrilling to see this many people come together around this topic. And the people I recognize have spent huge chunks of their career wrestling with these issues, careers and, and lifetimes, generations of, of folks trying to bridge the industrial, environmental, social gaps here. I, I guess I would address this uh, question to Mark, but uh, you all jump in if you think it pertains to you. What social skills and relationships can we develop in the road basin? be most effective in accomplishing restoration? Well, if you can't fight good, you better learn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, on a, on a more serious note, again, I'll just speak from personal experience. Um, it's really important to appreciate that reasonable people disagree. Reasonable people disagree. And it's important to figure out the source of those disagreements, and that involves, I think, treating, treating people humanely as individuals that warrant respect, probably have a good reason for their concerns. You can't understand it. That's what it's like to treat somebody charitably. So you ask questions. You try to figure out where they're coming from. You spend time with them, what we did. Um, again, it was painful. Some of the best <coughs> forward progress we had is when we, after a meeting, and again, people on both sides of the wall, we're not talking to one another, we're talking to an intermediary, 
talk about how grown up that is. <laughs> we go to the bar afterwards. It's a small bar, so we have to sit with the people we couldn't stand. <laughs> and you start, you find out that this person you don't think you like, maybe you don't like them, their kid plays soccer and you're a soccer coach. Or they love to elk hunt and you got a good bull this year. Or they like to fish. And that's what I mean, creating those situations where you learn that people are people. Maybe some really strong disagreements, but there is a lot of overlap and there can be some anger for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it requires humility. You have to admit that you've been wrong about some things, and most of us have in these situations. You're willing to listen to people, give them some respect, and go forward. And I can't help stress enough that part of the conversation is looking forward. This is the problem we got. This is where we are. How do we get to the desired outcome? That's the conversation to have instead of always looking back or being upset and stuff like that. So I think just some really good social skills, maturing, owning up to mistakes. I can just Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bill. Uh, for Chris, do you think uh, you're, you opened with the 1910? Uh, fire season, the big burn. Are we at a similar point in our collective consciousness here? Is this a, is the fire season we just had here and last year, and what we're looking forward to? Are we at a similar pivotal point in our reasoning about our role, our relationship with fire? Wow! I'm gonna write this down, Chris. Oh boy. <laughs> That, that's, that's a really interesting question, and I, I hate to sort of speak for everybody, and I think the, the people that have worked with collaborative groups probably will have a, a better answer than I do. There's been a lot of interest this year in, from OPB and other media sources and fire management specific. They're really getting beyond just the discussion about uh, the ecological sort of context, you know, the, what the timber industry is doing, what spotted owl did, what fire is suppression, but actually how are we managing fires? And that, that seems to be a shift, something new that, that the public is starting to become interested in, really, what's going on with fire management? Can we get past this? And I think that does at least give us, give me some hope that the public, all of you, and you're here today for, for obvious reasons, um, that we are at a similar state and that we are ready to come together possibly through collaboration and, and get there. And despite you know the, the lack of civility at our national level, we see all of these grassroots conversations and civility that are really expanding and really starting to become successful. So I would say that we, we if we're not there, we're on the verge of being there and we're ready to, to start to move forward in a holistic fashion. A softball question. Uh, Marco, how will we develop the workforce and infrastructure to accomplish <coughs> restoration on a landscape level? Well, um, based on some of the slides I shared in the, the last five I rushed through, um, essentially this has been in development for, for years. Uh, you know, with the shifting of the big tree timber economy. When I first moved here, I can remember the one tree log loads coming through town. Uh, there has been a shift. There was investments to the Jobs in the Woods program back in the 80s that we benefited from. Um, so that transition's been in motion. And uh, some of the slides I shared for these restoration efforts that are happening regionally, this is workforce effort has been in, in operation for years. Um, that capacity is being leaned on. We're, we're going to have to lean on each other. A lot of the work done on the Ashland Forest Resiliency Project has, has been from folks throughout the region, Mid Klamath Watershed, Fremont Wyneema coming to support each other um, through workforce training programs, um, through the change of, of the timber, uh, scaling of small diameter material, keeping our mill infrastructure in place, just that effort um, from the community based collaboratives to keep that workforce vibrant and alive is continuing on and uh, building that skill set as the Forest Service and the agencies seem to be downsizing, the community needs to be stepping up, um, investing in incubating businesses. has been a big effort as well in the service and the timber side. 
some very creative, innovative folks from the timber community who've had to make some uh, attempts to get these materials out in a really different way than historically they would have. So creativity, that creativity together uh, is ongoing. And then that investment um, in federal and state dollars to keep those uh, workforce development <coughs> efforts happening. Are you hopeful uh, that you'll see that federal and state dollar investment? <laughs> well, that's the, that is the challenge. But with with this fire season, um, you know, it's there is a, a urgency and an emergency. We have to address the, these these forests and these issues. Uh, the benefit of stewardship authority is we're able to utilize some of the retained receipts from the sale of the restoration byproducts, the logs, to then reinvest back into additional restoration and workforce development. So there's creative ways we can uh, match those resources, those funding resources, to get work done. Yeah, I just a slightly different, maybe, you know, slightly different side to that. It's kind of silly, actually. But, uh, our experience is that a big part of this is about helping the Forest Service shift how they do their work and what work they do. Um, and again, I'm as timber industry supportive as can be, but the Forest Service's job is not just about cutting trees for industry. And I'm very sympathetic to the environmental community, but it's not just about setting aside parcels that never see any active management. The challenge we have now, which is what Chris talked about, We've got a landscape that's in a certain condition. We need to figure out how to get it to a desired condition from where it is right now. And that's what the public, through informed public engagement, can help the Forest Service do. You can give them social license to go about their work differently. You can pressure Congress to actually fund the Forest Service at a level they need to be funded. <laughs> Those are other ways in which, whether it's a collaborative effort, a community effort, you can enhance and enable the Forest Service to go about their work different. As you shift that, you're going to start to create opportunities. They're going to open up things for new markets, for new training, and things like that. And so that's part of what we think about is how do we shift that? How do we help the Forest Service? That's going to make some shifts and some changes here. It's all about retooling. Thank you. Does that mean I have one minute to clear the table? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you have ten. Okay. I've got ten. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Very effective with those cards. <laughs> uh, Chris, I'm it's yours. Would you, uh, Chris, address? You know, we have a set of a certain set of objectives uh, and options on federal land. What options do we have? What do we do about creating fire resiliency or fire resistance on private industrial forest lands? Set me up with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so just to give a quick background, this, this all stems from a, a recent study and publication that I had looking at uh, the Douglas Complex fire in 2013 that burned up by Roseburg, and it burned across the, the ONC checkerboard landscape. And so you had every other square mile was private industrial force or was BLM force. Some of that being matrix, some of that being late successional reserves. Um, and through that process, we discovered that fires burn more severely on the private industrial force lands than the public lands. Right. So now, a lot of that had to do, has to do with the age of the force. So younger trees are just inherently more susceptible to uh, death by fire than large trees are. Um, so that's part of it. But they still had a signal beyond the age comparison across uh, those uh, the two ownership. And so it also was about the structure, probably the density at which planting occurred on the private industrial forest that facilitated uh, likely more active crown fires that, that really uniform fuel bed that's created. It's bigger than grass, but similar to what grass was or what we saw in the wheat fields uh, in the Northeast. Uh, of Oregon this year. And so it's a really continuous field there. And so private industrial forests do burn more severely. Um, I think, you know, they could restructure their force and their expectations, uh, but the, the economics really drive them to clear cut, right? So this is global economies and it really drives them to clear cut to maximize their revenue. 
and in the case of when they're public, uh, publicly owned, you know, so they're in the stock market, then, then they're really bound by that. They have to provide the, that real, in this case, in today's day, real short-term economic return. And so they do have a sort of a directive, and they're, they're stuck with that. Um, but at some point, you know, there's going to be enough fire that it's really going to flip that, where the fire risk is so high that it's no longer sustainable at, at that rate to, to expect that type of economic return. And they could uh, essentially switch from this civil culture type management to an uneven age that, that promotes the diversity of uh, stand structures where you have large trees uh, and, and the younger trees that will grow into those eventually. And those large trees are inherently more resilient to fire and therefore the economic loss when the fire comes uh, will be mitigated to some degree for them. And how that influences the larger landscape will, will change as well. And so how it influences adjacent ownerships. And, and we don't fully understand how that interaction plays out, whether there's some facilitated contribution or contagion that occurs from public to private or private to public yet, uh, but it's sort of ongoing efforts. And so they can shift to an uneven age type management, which would benefit them. They can also look at uh, internally within their blocks of land how they uh, retain various age classes of their, their forest and to minimize their overall loss. That is, if, if their square mile does burn, um, that at least a portion of it survives and can either be harvested in the future or is large enough at that time to harvest in a salvage context. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Marco, where do we uh, where do we target restoration work in the Rub Basin? Well, uh, the Rub Basin strategy uh, does address that. Um, those key locations, typically, like in the Ashland Forest Resiliency Project, is one example. Um, we're focused um, on our ridge tops, which typically are more the open stand conditions historically. Um, they also provide the benefit of fire suppression efforts in, in that case. Um, we tend to, we will stay out of, we'll still follow the Northwest Forest Plan, so we're, we're limiting any treatments on riparian reserves. We're protecting golden spot owl habitat, uh, which tends to be um, in more of the darker, um, dense areas. <clears throat> so that is a big part of the focus, is the area where we can restore those open conditions, open stand conditions. Thank you. Uh, sometimes we uh, we speak in uh, platitudes like, uh, "Do you want your smoke all at once, or do you want it a little bit all year long?" And uh, I know that's not really funny to folks that have been through impaired air quality like we like we had here this summer. Uh, can we accomplish restoration fire management without degrading? critical air quality, and I'd say any one of you could address that. <laughs> is, that is that a false choice? Or? No, but I, I think you have to put it in in scale. Yeah. Uh, you talk about where we're looking in maybe 20 or 30 years, the answer is I think yes. But if you're talking about this year, the answer is no. Um, it's just because of the situation we're in. Um, we're probably, even if desired conditions are relatively frequent, but low intensity fires, there will be more smoke than what we were used to as a community in the past. But that level of intensity doesn't necessarily mean that your health is impaired, your visibility is impaired, and so on. But that's looking down the road 15 or 20 years. And so for me, that's why I hesitate to give an answer because I think you've got to hedge it in a whole bunch of ways. Yeah. 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 He's absolutely right. Um, I did an assessment. I, you know, I think, say, we're, we're sort of in this, I guess, climax Douglas for a region here. And really, we're burning at 1% or 2% per year of the land base sort of an ongoing average. So it's rising and it's inclining, so that might accelerate. <laughs> the reality is, if we were to get back to, say, a 10-year fire return interval for some simple numbers, that we would have to burn 10% per year. But that's, that could be five to 10 times as much as it's burning right now. 
that's a cyborg. I don't know that we're necessarily driving to get to that state, but that should give you some semblance of where we could end up at some point. Now, if we did get there and in the long term got there, we're talking about certainly less intense smoke that arrives. Um, uh, it's it's going to be more dispersed and it wouldn't be as impactful to your health. That, again, is not in the near term. Um, but recognizing that fire is inevitable and accepting the inevitability of fire uh, is the first step to, to recognize that we're going to have to live with smoke. I think I once couched it by like, transitioning from smoky bear to smoky air. That's really what we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally what we're talking about. And you have to accept the fact that fire is inevitable, smoke is inevitable. Um, our decision point really is about what type of smoke or, what type of, or how dense that smoke is. Thank you. We have two minutes, and I'll give it to Mark. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, you know, thinking about prescribed fire and, and fire adapted environment going into the future, you know, we're looking at around 55,000 acres a year that will need to be ecologically and mechanically treated in a responsible fashion to set the stage for the reintroduction of fire or um, under fire suppression criteria, the management of fire that has a benefit to the resource. Um, so over the course of the next 20 to 30 years, there's a pretty heavy lift in the road basin of uh, that restorative work to set that stage, just to put the context on that part of it. So we're looking at about one-fourth of the landscape. And just to add, and I think this goes back to the point I made about asking what the landscape needs. Um, we're, we're talking about how do we avoid smoke impacts to us, which is entirely appropriate. But what's important to appreciate is the picture that Chris has talked about, that Marco's talking about getting the landscape to. Fire is a healthy part of a healthy landscape. So it's not just about us avoiding stuff. It's about us helping the landscape become healthy. And what that essentially exercise regime is, and figuring out how to live with that. And so I think those are the kind of questions that we need to have, conversations we need to have. It's not just about avoiding. What does it actually need? How will it improve that? How do we change? Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Very good job.